Hello everyone. Welcome to Stories with Mrs. Reed. A little bit of a later start today, but here we are. We are continuing on with our story, The Tale of Despero. Chapter eight, To the Rats. The Mouse Council, 13 honored mice and one most very honored head mouse, heeded the call of Lester's drum and gathered in a small secret hole off King Philip's throne room. The 14 mice sat around a piece of wood balanced on spools of thread and listened in horror while Despero's father related the story of what Furlough had seen. At the foot of the king, said Lester. Her finger right on top of his head, said Lester. He was looking up at her and it was not in fear. The mouse council members listened with their mouths open. They listened with their whiskers drooping and their ears flat against their heads. They listened in dismay and outrage and fear. When Lester finished, there was a silence dismal and deep. Something, intoned the most very honored head mouse, is wrong with your son. He is not well. This goes beyond his fevers, beyond his large ears and his lack of growth. He is deeply disturbed. His behavior endangers us all. Humans cannot be trusted. We know this to be an indisputable fact. A mouse who consorts with humans, a mouse who would sit right at the foot of a man, a mouse who would allow a human to touch him. And here the entire mouse council indulged in a collective shiver of disgust. Cannot be trusted. That is the way of the world, our world. Fellow mice, it is my most fervent hope that Despero has not spoken to these humans but obviously we can assume nothing. And this is a time to act, not wonder. Lester nodded his head in agreement and the 12 other members of the mouse council nodded their heads too. We have no choice, said the head mouse. He must go to the dungeon. He pounded his fisted paw on the table. He must go to the rats immediately. Members of the council, I will now ask you to vote. Those in favor of Despero being sent to the dungeon, say aye. There was a chorus of sad eyes. Those opposed, say nay. Silence reigned in the room. The only noise came from Lester. He was crying. And 13 mice, ashamed for Lester, looked away. Reader, can you imagine your own father not voting against your being sent to a dungeon full of rats? Can you imagine him not saying one word in your defense? Despero's father wept, and the most very honored head mouse beat his paw against the table again and said, Despero Tilling will appear before the mouse community. He will hear of his sins. He will be given a chance to deny them. If he does not deny them, he will be allowed to renounce them so that he may go to the dungeon with a pure heart. Despero Tilling is hereby called to sit with the mouse council. At least Lester had the decency to weep at his act of perfidy. Reader, do you know what the word perfidy means? I have a feeling you do, based on the little scene that has just unfolded here. But you should look up the word in your dictionary, just to be sure. Chapter nine, the right question. The mouse council sent Furlough to collect Despero, and Furlough found his brother in the library, standing on top of the great open book his tail wrapped tightly around his feet, his small body shivering. Despero was reading the story out loud to himself. He was reading from the beginning so that he could get to the end, where the reader was assured that the knight and the fair maiden lived happily together ever after. Despero wanted to read those words, happily ever after. He needed to say them aloud. He needed some assurance that this feeling he had for the Princess P, his love, would come to a good end. And so he was reading the story as if it were a spell, and the words of it, spoken aloud, could make magic happen. See here, said Furlough, out loud to himself. He looked at his brother and then looked away. This is just the kind of thing I'm talking about. This is exactly the kind of thing. What's he doing here, for Christ's sake? He's not eating the paper. He's talking to the paper. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. Hey, he said to Despero. Despero kept reading. Hey, shouted Furlough. Despero, the mouse council wants you. 
Pardon, said Despero. He looked up from the book. The Mouse Council has called you to sit with them. Me, said Despero. You. I'm busy right now, said Despero, and he bent his head again to the open book. Furlo sighed. Geez, he said. Cripes, nothing makes sense to this guy. Nothing. I was right to turn him in. He's sick. Furlo crawled up the chair leg and then hopped onto the book. He sat next to Despero. He tapped him on the head twice. Hey, he said, the Mouse Council isn't asking. They're telling. They're commanding. You have to come with me right now. Despero turned to Furlo. Do you know what love is, he said. Huh? Love. Furlo shook his head. You're asking the wrong question, he said. The question you should be asking is why the Mouse Council wants to see you. There is somebody who loves me, said Despero, and I love her, and that is the only thing that matters to me. Somebody who loves you? Somebody who you love? What difference does that make? What matters is that you're in a lot of trouble with the Mouse Council. Her name, said Despero, is P. What? The person who loves me. Her name is P. Cripes, said Furlo. You're missing the whole point of everything here. You're missing the point of being a mouse. You're missing the point of being called to sit with the mouse council. You've got to come with me. It's the law. You've been called. Despero sighed. He reached out and touched the words fair maiden in the book. He traced them with one paw, and then he put his paw to his mouth. Cripes, said Furlo. You're making a fool of yourself. Let's go. I honor you, whispered Despero. I honor you. And then, reader, he followed Furlow over the book and down the chair leg and across the library floor to the waiting mouse council. He allowed his brother to lead him to his fate. Chapter 10, Good Reasons. The entire mouse community, as instructed by the most very honored head mouse, had gathered behind the wall of the castle ballroom. The members of the mouse council sat atop three bricks piled high and spread out before them was every mouse, old and young, foolish and wise, who lived in the castle. They were all waiting for Despero. Make way, said Furlo. Here he is. I've got to make way. Furlo pushed through the crowd of mice. Despero clung to his brother's tail. There he is, the mice whispered. There he is. He's so small. They say he was born with his eyes open. Some of the mice pulled away from Despero in disgust and others, thrill-seekers, reached out to touch him with a whisker or a paw. The princess put a finger on him. They say he sat at the foot of the king. It simply is not done, came the distinctive voice of Despero's Aunt Florence. Make way, make way, shouted Furlow. I have him right here. I have Despero Tilling, who has been called to sit with the Mouse Council. He led Despero to the front of the room. Honored members of the Mouse Council, started Furlow, I have brought you Despero Tilling, as he requested, to sit with you. He looked over his shoulder at Despero. Let go of me, Furlow said. Despero dropped Furlow's tail. He looked up at the members of the Mouse Council. His father met his gaze, and then shook his head and looked away. Despero turned and faced the sea of mice. To the dungeon, a voice cried out. Straight to the dungeon with him. Despero's head, which had been full of such delightful phrases as happily ever after and lovely ears and I honor you, suddenly cleared. Straight to the dungeon, another voice shouted. Enough, said the most very honored head mouse. This trial will be conducted in an orderly fashion. We will act civilized. He cleared his throat. He said to Despero, son, turn and look at me. Despero turned. He looked up and into the head mouse's eyes. They were dark eyes, deep and sad and frightened. And looking into them, Despero's heart thudded once, twice. Despero Tilling, said the head mouse. Yes, sir, said Despero. We, the 14 members of the mouse council, have discussed your behavior. First, we will give you a chance to defend yourself against these rumors of your egregious acts. Did you or did you not sit at the foot of the human king? I did, said Despero. But I was listening to the music, sir. I was there to hear the song that the king was singing. 
to hear the what? The song, sir. He was singing a song about the deep purple falling over sleepy garden walls. The head mouse shook his head. Whatever are you talking about is beside the point. The question is this, and only this. Did you sit at the foot of the human king? I did, sir. The community of mice shifted their tails and paws and whiskers. They waited. And did you allow the girl human, the princess, to touch you? Her name is P. Never mind her name. Did you allow her to touch you? Yes, sir, said Despero. I let her touch me. It felt good. A gasp arose from the assembled mice. Despero heard his mother's voice. Mon Dieu, it is not the end of the world. It was a touch of, what of it? It is simply not done, came on Florence's voice from the crowd. To the dungeon, said a mouse in the front row. Silence, roared the most very honored head mouse. Silence. He looked down at Despero. Do you, Despero Tilling, understand the sacred, never to be broken rules of conduct for being a mouse? Yes, sir, said Despero. I guess so, but did you break them? Yes, sir, said Despero. He raised his voice. But I broke the rules for good reasons, because of music and because of love. Love, said the head mouse. Oh, cripes, said Furlow. Here we go. I love her, sir, said Despero. We are not here to talk about love. This trial is not about love. This trial is about you being a mouse, shouted the most very honored head mouse from high atop the bricks, and not acting like one. Yes, sir, said Despero. I know. No, I don't think you do know. And because you do not deny the charges, you must be punished. You are to be sent, as ancient castle mouse law decrees, to the dungeon. You are being sent to the rats. That's right, shouted a mouse in the crowd. That's the ticket. The dungeon, the rats. Desro's small heart sank all the way to the tip of his tail. There would be no light in the dungeon, no stained glass windows, no library and no books. There would be no Princess P. But first, said the most very honored head mouse, we will give you the chance to renounce your actions. We will allow you to go to the dungeon with a pure heart. Renounce? Repent. Say that you are sorry you sat at the foot of the human king. Say that you are sorry you allowed the human princess to touch you. Say that you regret these actions. Despero felt hot, and then cold, and then hot again. Renounce her? Renounce the princess? Mon Dieu! shouted his mother. Son, do not act the fool! Renounce! Repent! What say you, Despero Tilling? I say, I say, I say, no, whispered Despero. What, said the head mouse? No, said Despero, and this time he did not whisper the word. I am not sorry. I will not renounce my actions. I love her. I love the princess. There was a bellow of collective outrage. The whole of the mouse community surged toward Despero. The mice seemed to become one angry body with hundreds of tails and thousands of whiskers and one huge, hungry mouth opening and closing and opening and closing, saying over and over and over again, to the dungeon, to the dungeon, to the dungeon. The words pounded through Despero's body with each beat of his heart. Very well, said the most very honored head mouse. You will die then with a black heart. Threadmaster, he called. Bring out the thread. Despero marveled at his own bravery. He admired his own defiance. And then, reader, he fainted. Chapter 11, The Threadmaster Cometh. When Despero came to, he heard the drum. His father was beating a rhythm that had much more boom and much less tat. Together, Lester and the drum produced an ominous sound that went something like this. Boom. Boom, boom, tat. Boom, 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 tat. Make way for the thread, cried a mouse who was pushing a wooden spool of red thread through the crowd. Make way for the thread. 
boom, 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 tapped, went the drum. To the dungeon, shouted the mice. Despero lay on his back, blinking his eyes. How, he wondered, had things gone so terribly wrong? Wasn't it a good thing to love? In the story in the book, love was a very good thing because the knight loved the fair maiden. He was able to rescue her. They lived happily ever after. It said so in the book. They were the last words on the page, happily ever after. Despero was certain that he had read exactly those words time and time again. Lying on the floor with the drum beating and the mice shouting and the threadmaster calling out, make way, make way. Despero had a sudden chilling thought. Had some other mouse eaten the words that spoke the truth? Did the knight and the fair maiden really not live happily ever after? Reader, do you believe that there is such thing as happily ever after? Or like Despero, have you too begun to question the possibility of happy endings? Happily ever after, whispered Despero. Happily ever after, he said again as the spool of thread came to a stop beside him. The thread, the thread, the thread! murmured the mice. I'm sorry, said the mouse behind the spool, but I have to ask you to stand up. I have to do my job. Despero got slowly to his feet. Open your hind legs, please, said the thread master. It's the rules. Despero stood on his hind legs. Thank you, said the mouse. I appreciate it. While Despero watched, the thread master unwound a length of red thread from the spool and tied a loop. Just enough for the neck, muttered the mouse. No more, no less. That's what the last threadmaster taught me. Enough thread for the neck. He looked up at Despero and then back down at the loop of thread. And you, my friend, have a small neck. The threadmaster raised his arms and put them around Despero's neck. He leaned in close and Despero smelled celery. He could feel the threadmaster's breath in his ear as he worked at tightening a thread. Is she beautiful? The threadmaster whispered. What? said Despero. Shh! Is the princess beautiful? The princess P? Yes. She is lovely beyond all imagining, said Despero. Just right, the threadmaster said. He drew back. He nodded his head. A lovely princess, just so, like a fairy tale. And you love her as a knight loves a maiden. You love her with a courtly love, a love that is based on bravery and courtesy and honor and devotion. Just so. How do you know that, Despero said. How do you know about fairy tales? Shh. The mouse leaned in close and Despero smelled celery again, green and alive. Be brave, friend, whispered the threadmaster. Be brave for the princess. And then he stepped back and turned and shouted, fellow mice. The thread has been tied. The thread has been knotted. A roar of approval went up from the crowd. Despero squared his shoulders. He had made a decision. He would do as the threadmaster had suggested. He would be brave for the princess. Even if, reader, could it be true? There was no such thing as happily ever after. Chapter 12, Adieu. The sound of the drum changed again. The final tat disappeared and it became nothing but boom, 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 boom. Lester used only his tail, bringing it down with great force and seriousness upon the drum. The threadmaster retreated. The room full of mice fell silent, expectant, waiting. And as Despero stood before them with the red thread around his neck and the 14 members of the mouse council perched on the bricks above him, two burly mice came forward. Black pieces of cloth covered their heads. There were slits for their eyes. We, said the bigger of the two mice, will escort you to the dungeon. Despero, Annette Antoinette called out. Ah, oh, my Despero. Despero looked out into the crowd of mice and saw his mother. She was easy to spot. In honor of her youngest mouse being sent to the dungeon, she had put on a tremendous amount of makeup. Each of the hooded mice put a paw on Despero's shoulder. It's time, said the one on the left, the first hood. Antoinette pushed her way through the crowd. He is my son, she said. 
I want to have a last word with my son. Despero looked at his mother. He concentrated on standing before her without trembling. He concentrated on not being a disappointment. Please, said Antoinette, what will happen to him? What will happen to my baby? Ma'am, said the first hood, his voice was deep and slow. You don't want to know. I want to know, I want to know, he is my child, the child of my heart, the last of my mice babies. The hooded mice said nothing. Tell me, said Antoinette. The rats, said the first. The rats, said the second. Yes, yes, the rats, what of them? The rats will eat him, said the second hood. Oh, mon dieu, said Antoinette. At the thought of being eaten by rats, Despero forgot about being brave. He forgot about not being a disappointment. He felt himself heading into another faint, but his mother, who had an excellent sense of dramatic timing, beat him to it. She executed a beautiful, flawless swoon, landing right at Despero's feet. Now you've done it, said the first hood. It doesn't matter, said the second. Step over her. We have a job to do. Nobody's mother is going to stop us. To the dungeon. To the dungeon, repeated the first hood, but his voice, so deep and certain a moment ago, now shook a tiny bit. He put a paw on Despero and tugged him forward, and the two hoods and Despero stepped over Antoinette. The crowd parted. The mice began again to chant, to the dungeon, to the dungeon, to the dungeon. The drumbeat continued, and Despero was led away. At the last moment, Antoinette came out of her faint and shouted one word to her child. That word, reader, was adieu. Do you know the definition of adieu? Don't bother with your dictionary, I will tell you. Adieu is the French word for farewell. Farewell is not the word that you would like to hear from your mother as you are being led to the dungeon by two oversized mice in black hoods. Words that you would like to hear are, take me instead, I will go to the dungeon in my son's place. There is a great deal of comfort in those words. But reader, there is no comfort in the word farewell. Even if you say it in French, farewell is a word that in any language is full of sorrow. It is a word that promises absolutely nothing. Chapter 13, Perfidy Unlimited. Oh, perfidy unlimited. Together, the three mice traveled down, down, down. The thread around Despero's neck was tight. He felt as if it was choking him. He tugged at it with one paw. Don't touch the thread, barked the second hood. Yeah, echoed the first hood. Don't touch the thread. They moved quickly, and whenever Despero slowed, one of the two hoods poked him in the shoulder and told him to keep moving. They went through holes in the wall and down golden stairs. They went past rooms with doors that were closed and doors that were flung open. The three mice traveled across, a marble, uh, across marble floors and under heavy velvet drapes. They moved through warm patches of sunlight and dark pools of shade. This, thought Despero, was the world he was leaving behind, the world that he knew and loved. And somewhere in it, the Princess P was laughing and smiling and clapping her hands to music unaware of Despero's fate, that he would not be able to let the princess know what had become of him seemed suddenly unbearable to the mouse. Would it be possible for me to have a last word with the princess? Despero asked. A word, said the second hood. You want a word with a human? I want to tell her what has happened to me. Jeez, said the first hood. He stopped and stamped a paw on the floor in frustration. Cripes, you can't learn, can you? The voice was terribly familiar to Despero. Furlough, he said. What, said the first hood irritably. Despero shuddered. His own brother was delivering him to the dungeon. His heart stopped beating and shrunk to a small, cold, disbelieving pebble. But then, just as quickly, it leapt alive again, beating with hope. Furlough, Despero said, and he took one of his brother's paws in his own. Please let me go. Please, I'm your brother. Furlough rolled his eyes. He took his paw out of Despero's. No, he said. 
No way. Please, said Despero. No, said Furlow. Rules are rules. Reader, do you recall the word perfidy? As our story progresses, perfidy becomes an even more appropriate word, doesn't it? Perfidy was certainly the word that was in Despero's mind as the mice finally approached the narrow, steep, uh, the narrow steep steps that led to the black hole of the dungeon. They stood, the three mice, two with hoods and one without, and contemplated the abyss before them. And then Furlow stood up on his hind legs and placed his right paw over his heart. For the good of the castle mice, he announced to the darkness, we deliver this day to the dungeon a mouse in need of punishment. He is, according to the laws we have established, wearing the red thread of death. The red thread of death, repeated Despero in a small voice. Wearing the red thread of death was a terrible phrase, but the mouse didn't have long to consider its implications because he was suddenly pushed from behind by the hooded mice. The push was a strong one, and it sent Despero flying down the stairs into the dungeon. As he tumbled whisker over tail through the darkness, there were only two words in his mind. One was perfidy, and the other word that he clung to was P. Perfidy, P, perfidy, P. These were the words that pinwheeled through Despero's mind as his body descended into the darkness. And that is where we will stop for today. We will be back tomorrow to hear what happens next for our poor friend Despero in the dungeon. Have a great rest of your day.